Glad you're here to worship God and give him all the praise and glory. Uh, I've just got uh, one little item. Well, no, that's not true. I want to tell folks that uh, if, if you're connected with the uh, leadership team, that we've got a consultation on the 26th over at Wellington Church with the district superintendent. It's the uh, staff parish relations consultation on the 26th. We've got charge conference on November 13th up at Sandusky Trinity. Like that's not enough district and conference activity. They just sent uh, this flyer to me on Friday. This is the Leadership Academy. Uh, leadership training for anybody that's interested in church leadership. Uh, November 6th at uh, Shelby Trinity United Methodist Church. They, kind of, they combined Firelands with the uh, Mid-Ohio District, so they're taking care of all of that, all of that at once. Um, so invitation, and I'll leave this uh, in the uh, narthex, uh, if you, or ask me if you've got questions, I, I can share a little bit with you on that. What other business of the church do we have this morning that we need to lift up? We've got prayers, uh, we've got concerns and joys a little later, but, uh, well, why don't we go to God then? Uh, oh, I have yeah, oh, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 around. I just didn't. In the year of 2022, it's an exciting year for this, our church, North Fairfield United Methodist Church. We will be celebrating our 200th anniversary of the founding of the church, not the church building that was 1844, but in 1822, members of the community started meeting together and that's when they formed the North Fairfield Methodist Church. So in order to start, hi. <laughs> In yeah. order to, to start the planning process, I am asking for any volunteers that would be interested in being on a committee to organize how we will celebrate this wonderful, wonderful anniversary. So if you have any interest in any ideas that you would like to share, let me know and we will become organized. Thank you. Good morning. Will you join me please in our call to worship? It'll be a responsive reading. And it'll be on its screen. Yours is in the bold, be easier for you to read. If I created the universe with all its stars and planets, can't I fix your brokenness? Trust me, I got this. Lord, help us to trust you. If I laid the foundation of the earth, measured its dimensions, placed my son as cornerstone of my creation, then surely I can heal your disagreements. Trust me, I got this. Lord, help us to trust you. If I created the sea, the sky, the moon, the sun, then surely I have the cure for your diseases. Trust me. I got this. Lord, help us to trust you. If I took clay and molded you into being, if I gave you breath to live, if I gave you my word as a compass, then surely I can take you back from the grip of sin and death. Trust me, I got this. Lord, help us to trust you. Let us pray. You show us that you are here for us but we are slow to trust. We turn to the world and think we can provide and hope things will work out. We seek vices to numb our pain, but the pain still exists. Help us, O oh Lord, to place our hopes, dreams, fears, plans, and doubts into your loving hands. Amen. Amen. Will you stand now and sing with us um, the opening hymn, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, and that will be number 462 or on the screen.
Amen. Please be seated. It's time now to dedicate our offering to the Lord. So in the wisdom of Proverbs, in the words of King Solomon, I give you this meditation. He wrote, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Dear God, you are the author of all goodness, and you've entrusted us with material possessions and made us stewards of your abundance. Lord, this morning, please accept these gifts that we offer to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for that gift of music. So uh, I have a concern to uh, lift up, and that is the passing, I believe last night, of uh, Butch Gilger. We want to keep Barb Gilger and uh, her family in our prayers at the passing of uh, of Butch. Yeah, our deepest sympathy goes out to them. So let me ask you, what else shall we lift up this morning? Uh, By way of joys, by way of concerns. Yes, uh, quite. Sister Virginia is progressing well through treatment. It's going to be a long road, but we thank the Lord for healing. Yes, indeed, Kathy. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah, wow. For now, twice a week. <laughs> Someday, maybe twice a year. <laughs> well, that's nothing but good news, is it? Yeah, praise the Lord for, again, for healing. I, I guess I want to lift up my wife, Sherry. Uh, she had just a, a couple of bone spurs taken off her foot. She had this same procedure done on the other foot back in June. And she got up and around and was just fine, you know, a few days later. Not so much this time. It's a little tougher. She's, uh, she's here in spirit, and I, I'm sure she, she wants to send her love to each of you, but uh, she's just having a little tougher time this go around. Uh, so appreciate the prayers. What else? Women's Emmaus Walk. We want to lift that up, Carl? Yeah. Praise God for that and, and the transformation that we know the Lord will make in their lives, the rededication of their, their discipleship. What else? Well, let's take this and, and the ones that we hold in our heart and let's go to the Lord in, in a word of prayer. Uh, let's just begin with a time of silent confession just to to, to lift up to the Lord, you know, those, uh, those things that we need forgiveness for. And then I'll lead a pastoral prayer, and we can, uh, we can finish with the Lord's Prayer together. Let's go to God. Heavenly Father, remind us this morning that, uh, that all Christian ministry is Christ's work of outreaching love. Help us to live into our common life together, our, our community of faith with gratitude and devotion, that our witness would shine forth, that our service would lead the way, that our discipleship would be an inspiration to those who know us. Lord, we lift up uh, Barb and, and the family of Butch Gilger this morning. We, we know they're grieving and, and their pain can only be soothed by your Holy Spirit for the love and the comfort of your Holy Spirit. Uh, we 
thank you for recovery for Virginia and, and just thank you that you're going with her and, and with Gary as they continue to improve and, and go through the process of recovery. We, we ask the same blessing on Sherry as, as every day she'll get a little stronger, a little better. We thank you, Lord, for the women who committed to the Emmaus Walk. We lift each one of their lives to you this morning and pray and, and with confidence that you'll reach out and you'll touch them uh, and that each one of them will rededicate themselves to the life in you. May we all be renewed, Lord, and fulfilled in our Christian ministry of servanthood. As your holy church, let us participate in your ministries of grace and stretching out to human need wherever service will speak God's message of love, that all who receive the blessing would be renewed in your image and that all Christians, would minister in deed and words that heal and set free. And so we're reminded this morning of the words which you taught your disciples to say, and, and we as your church, as your disciples, join with them, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Lyndon just to stand where you're at and help us uh, with the first scripture reading this morning. This comes from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest is selected from among men, is an appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are in ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. Amen. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who would save him from death. And he is heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God. We're going to stand for our uh, hymn of praise. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Would, can we sing together?
Please be seated. Take a minute and catch your breath. Thank you, Dennis. That was just wonderful, just lovely. So our, uh, our scripture lesson this morning is from uh, the Gospel according to St. Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. This, this is a request from the Apostles James and John to be glorified like Christ. We just, we just sang all about the glory of, of Jesus and, and the crown which he wears. Now here come some lowly fishermen with a similar desire. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus replied. They said, Let one of us sit at your right and the other in your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking. Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? We are able, or we can, <laughs> is how this translation reads. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup that I drink. You will be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have been prepared. Now when the other ten apostles heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. But Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord, excuse me, lord it over them. And there are high officials, again, a little different translation, 
uh, they, the tyrants, it says, exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be the greatest of you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is God's holy word. May we, like those apostles, seek to serve rather than to be served. Amen. I just want to pause here. I should have lifted this up during our time of prayer as a joy, but boy, it wasn't, wasn't worship last week just wonderful? Laity Sunday, I mean, the gifts of our congregation were just poured forth, and everybody, you know, would just enjoy, I know I did, I just enjoyed worshiping, rather than, you know, doing all this preparation and wondering what I'm supposed to say. No, no, no. The gifts and the graces are there. Now, you know, sometimes people are a little bit reluctant to stand in front of a crowd, and that's understandable, especially with the gospel. The gospel is so precious. They go, oh, I'm not worthy. And, and none of us are, except by the righteousness of Jesus' blood. So... I don't think that's exactly what James and John were getting at in this scripture lesson this morning. You know, they, they were kind of taking a little more human perspective on this uh, idea of being glorified with Jesus. They came with some pretty human ambition that, that drove them to covet that top spot, you know, the right hand and the left hand. And, and they wanted this gift that Jesus has just given to them. You know, they didn't want to work for it. They didn't want to toil for it. They, they, forgive me if I say it this way, but they wanted the reward without really trying. Of course, Jesus connect, uh, corrects that notion pretty, pretty quickly. He said to be successful in, in life, to be the one that reaches the top, you've got to turn the notions of the world upside down. If you want to be the greatest, you've got to be a servant. If you want to be first, you have to be a slave. And then he goes on and he compares their desire. I say it didn't come through in this translation, but uh, in the uh, New Revised Standard, it says you, it's the tyrants of the world that want to lord their power over the people that they rule. That's a pretty strong comparison. I mean, just, just go in your mind for a minute. Who's a tyrant that you think about when you hear that word? Hitler in Germany, yeah, that's an obvious one. Stalin in Russia, sure, we remember that. How about these days? Who, who's a tyrant in the world? I think about the poor, suffering folks in North Korea under the dictatorship of of uh, Kim Jong-il. It's, it's a terrible way to rule people. And it's kind of hard to get James and John, these wonderful apostles, into that mold. But that's because Jesus wanted to correct them right away and get them to understand it ain't like that in the kingdom of heaven. To, to put this in perspective, in, in, into the context, Jesus had just got through telling these folks that we're on our way to Jerusalem. And when I get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests 
and they're going to condemn me to death, and then they're going to send me over to the Romans, and I'm going to be mocked and spit on and whipped and killed. But in three days I'll rise again. Now this is the third time he's, he tells them this in, in the Gospel of Mark, and it's the last time that he says it in the Gospel of Mark. I mean, they're on their way to Jerusalem. And, and you know, the, the apostles must have had some idea that he was going to be glorified, but the way that James and John approach it just shows that they didn't quite understand what it was that Jesus was going to do. So he clarifies it for them. He says, yeah, yeah, one day you'll drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I, that I am baptized with. And you know, if you look at that in the Old Testament context, you know, we, we think of the cup of Jesus as the, the cup of salvation that he poured out his blood for us. But in the Old Testament, it talks about the cup of wrath that would be poured out by God upon the sinners. And it, it is that very cup that Jesus drank so that we wouldn't have to experience that wrath of God. And of course, baptism, baptism is an initiation. It's an entering into. Well, you know, if we're baptized into the church, we become initiated into the church. What Jesus is talking about, he says, we're on our way to Jerusalem. The baptism that I'm entering into is my own passion. This has already begun. I'm on my way to become the victim of this wrath of God for your sake. So, if you think about what James and John were asking for, it, it just shows how naive they were in, in talking to Jesus about it that way and about their aspirations to sit upon the throne, throne of glory. How, you know, these simple fishermen, how is it that they could be qualified to, to take on the, the most exalted office next to Jesus? And you'll forgive me, you know, I was trying to think of a metaphor for this. And I'm going to date myself pretty clearly. When I tell you what I thought about it, it was that old musical from Broadway where the main character, J. Pierpont Fitch, uh, rises, skyrockets from a window washer to the chairman of the board. How to succeed in business without really trying. Now, like I say, I know that dates me, but I, I hope that you've run across this in the culture somewhere along the line. You know, it's been reprised by high school drama clubs and little theaters. I, do you ever, they ever show that in Branson? you ever get any snippets of, uh, of uh, how to succeed in business? You know, this guy didn't have any talent, but by the pluck and, and, and his following the, the how-to manual of, of how to get ahead in life, he makes this meteoric rise. Uh, in the closing scene of the, uh, of the play, Finch, you, you can tell that he's got his eyes set on the White House as his next step. So I wondered if this wasn't kind of the ambitious aim of, of James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee, that their human ambition was to covet this, this top prize, but they wanted the reward without really trying. Uh, let me give you the other metaphor that, uh, you know, Jesus says, I can't tell you who it is going to sit on my right hand and my left hand when I go into my glory. 
but I want to take you to the hill in Calvary where Jesus is hanging on the cross in the glory of his crucifixion. The one on his right hand and the one on his left are rebels, thieves, sinners. You know, James and John had a different role but these are the ones that God chose, the lowest of the low, to be on his right hand and on his left hand. And we know that the one thief mocked him. But the other just asked, Lord, let me be in paradise with you. Now, James and John could have been the ones crucified with Jesus, they, they could have been if they'd have stood up in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Romans came to uh, arrest him. And said, no, 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 this is an innocent man. If they'd have done that, they might have got their wish. They might have been the ones on the right hand and the left hand. Or if they'd have stood up at the trial with the Sanhedrin and said, no, this is an innocent man. He's done nothing wrong. They might have been condemned to the same uh, execution that Jesus was condemned. Or if they just stood before Pilate and, and, and confronted the crowd and said, no, 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 don't crucify him. He's an innocent man. They might have been the ones. But they weren't. Jesus showed James and John and all the disciples who'd follow after them that the true way to success was not to be a tyrant, but to be a slave or a servant. A slave or a servant. Let me ask you, what does it take? Do you ha how hard do you have to try to be a slave or to be a servant? I mean, is, is there a special skill that's involved there? Is there something that you can bring to set at the feet of Jesus, a special talent? There's only one thing that's required. And that's your submission. Just to say, all the gifts that you've given me, God, I can only use to glorify you. That's what's required. You can do it without really trying very hard. You can succeed in this life if you're willing to submit. And you can succeed in the next life by being a servant or being a slave. As Christians, that's the gift that we should desire above all others. I, I wish I could say that I always do that, but that's not been the case in my life. I, I, I wish... You know, that it was something beyond just being a preacher, being a pastor. But God's given me these gifts, and sometimes I can exercise them, and sometimes I just fumble foolishly with them. But I, what I do know in my heart of hearts is that you have to have this humble spirit. And people need to see that in your ministry. And I thank God that we had that wonderful display last week where folks did get to see our gifts on display in our worship here. How wonderful the ministry of the laity is. And then each of us can just ask for a little more humble portion 
to return to God. That we might succeed in life without really trying. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to stand and sing. I think this is just a, a little chorus from the, uh, from the black hymnal. Hope you don't mind me using this. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, number 2171, make me a channel of your peace. Would you stand? Let's sing this together. Lord God, our Father, we ask this blessing, that we may go from this place to love and to serve others. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.